We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome and uh, apologies for the, uh, the slight delay here. Um, we have, we've had some, some slight difficulties, uh, technical difficulties, um, uh, uh, getting, getting, uh, going here, but, uh, but here we are <laughs> and all, all the panelists are, are now here. Um, thank you all very much for, for joining, um, for joining this session. This is session 33, Empowering Persons with Disabilities, Accessible Technology. Um, so uh, just, a, 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 again, my name is my name is Brian Scarpelli. Uh, I'm a, uh, very briefly about myself and then I'll uh, just just maybe do a little bit of frame setting and then I'd love to, to, to we can jump right in uh, here. But um, uh, I'm a, a Senior Global Policy Council with with uh, ACT, the App Association. The, the App Association is a not-for-profit uh, uh, advocacy organization for small businesses in the small in the the uh, software development and technology development uh, segment of of industry widely, you know, across enterprise and consumer uh, uh, contexts. Um, uh, a, a huge priority for our community is. In advancing accessibility and, and building in and, and, and advancing the idea of accessibility by design. So you can probably imagine how um, excited I and my organization are to be a part of an IGF session that uh, that 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 addresses ICT and accessibility. And uh, and I think um, we have uh, uh, some some great some great speakers here uh, uh, that. That will uh, uh, that that will turn that that I'll turn it over to in just a second when we get started. But uh, the goal of our session is to explore innovative uses of ICTs for the empowerment of persons with disabilities. For uh, 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 we'd like to you know talk about the possible today in enhancing awareness of what is possible as well as what's coming down the, the down the pipeline. Uh, and we hope that this discussion will inspire the IGF community to. Further action and cross-sector collaboration that's needed to realize the potential of ICTs in in in, improve, in continuing to improve accessibility. Um, uh, of course, we should uh, uh, probably uh, touch on some some timely developments. Uh, uh, the, the the pandemic's in influence on ICT developments and usership, for example, I think is an interesting aspect to talk about, but. I should. I, I, I think uh, we're supposed to mention our expected outcomes. They are to understand how universal design principles for accessibility can be advanced across the internet to improve and uh, the experience of those with disabilities. They uh, second to capture and understand the uses of ICTs enabled by the internet that are uh, today empowering persons with disabilities as well as what's coming uh, down the pipeline. Uh, also, learning about what the IGF community can do. To, uh, to, to further to advance action and cross sectoral collaboration, realizing the potential of ICTs to improve the experience is of those with disabilities and, uh, and, and fourth to appreciate the diverse perspectives regarding priorities and or changes needed from an internet governance policy standpoint to accelerate progress towards a more inclusive internet for persons with disabilities and take action um, to address needed changes. Uh, I, 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 I think, uh, you know, just, uh, I, I've probably taken up too much time here given that we had a bit of a late start, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, we can, we, we thought that we'd take a few minutes for each panelist to give some opening remarks. I certainly have some questions uh, that, I'm that I have in my back pocket as moderator. Uh, but uh, but we'd love to have your engagement, audience. Uh, anyone in the audience uh, 
so so please have your questions ready and and uh you know and and, and you can uh, uh put them in the uh 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 chat i will keep a look out there uh for uh for those uh so uh so why don't i just throw it to the panelists for their opening remarks and i can defer to you all to give a little bit of an introduction of of yourself on uh, your 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 background and 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 uh and current roles etc uh that uh that, that that you'd like to share um jorge is that okay if i throw it to you yes thanks brian um i hope you guys can hear me um uh, finally happy to be to be able to join it was a, such a difficult task um so to begin with i'll just start to introduce uh, myself briefly so my name is george manik i'm from uh, mozambique um so i mostly um uh, have been working on disability rights in general, disability rights inclusion, and particularly with, with specific interest on the issues of uh, access and accessibility in regards to ICT, but not only. So um, it's really a pleasure for me to, to, to be here today and to be talking about this very important topic, um, and especially at this point in time where we um, going through the COVID pandemic. And as we know, because of that, um, most of the services, opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, have moved to the, from, to the, to the uh, online um, world, right? So from the physical to the online world. And that makes it even more uh, important, the issue of um, um, access and accessibility of the ICT um, environment. So, um, but just to, um, to, 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 I wanted to start by just throwing in, I mean, out some of the um, data, some of the, the data that have been produced. And I have here um, uh, data from the report that was conducted by GSMA uh, in um, two countries, one in Africa, Kenya, and also in, uh, in, in Bangladesh. Um, which indicates, I mean, uh, in general, that there's this uh, lake of awareness uh, when it comes to accessibility um, features and the impact that that uh, may have on uh, access for persons with disabilities. And um, also points out that in general, um, uh, mobile phones, so this, this particular study was uh, focus on mobile access and accessibility. So it points out that uh, mobile access in most of the communities in those countries is still unaffordable for persons with disabilities. So to get the hardware itself is still um, very difficult. And um, uh, it points to a very particular thing, which is very interesting for us here to look at is that uh, the, the role that relatives and uh, caregivers still play when it comes to access to uh, technology for persons with disability. So um, because most, many persons with disabilities, they're not able to have to own, uh, let's say a device itself, uh, they will rely mostly on family members, caregivers to be able to um, have access to those, to those, uh, to, to technology. Um, and, and that's, speaks a lot on you know, the liberty, independ independence and autonomy that the person can have um, uh, when it comes to ICT accessibility. Um, the, the, this study also points to um, the fact that uh, education, and this is something I'm sure we all know, education and the type of disability, as well as gender, uh, big determinants when it comes to ownership. Um, including the, 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 the type of mobile phone the person uh, may, may or may not own. So those are the big determinants. So the type of disability, uh, the level of education, but also gender. And that speaks um, to the issues that, I mean, although we are here talking about disability, uh, it's important to 
uh, recognize that we're not talking about an homogeneous uh, group. Uh, there are difference within the movement, within the group. There may be groups uh, and those usually tend to be persons with physical disabilities that may have a little bit more um, um, uh, ability and um, uh, chances to own or possibilities to own uh, to, uh, and, and enjoy from uh, the ICT devices. Um, but there are the groups uh, and I mean, often persons with intellectual disabilities who may be even more excluded um, or person with deaf blindness who may be even excluded. So when we talk about ICT accessibility, it's really important to go um, and look at those specific uh, groups that may be overlooked because we are just focused on the bigger picture, uh, which is disability here. Um, so uh, although there are people that tend to have access to uh, mobile um, mobile phones, so within the, the those groups, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, within the, 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 the disability movement, there are more, uh, uh, less chances that they will hold or they will own, uh, let's say, smartphones. So they will have uh, telephones, mobile phones with um, very basic features, which means they will not be able to enjoy and you know the maximum possibilities that smartphones, um, um, you know, uh, uh, represents in terms of futures, features that they have, and what they, the possibilities that they they may uh, uh, open up to the users. Um, so most persons with disabilities are not able to own those because, as I mentioned, they are very expensive. Um, uh, they may not be able to, you know, because of the education, they may not be have the literacy that may enable them to explore fully the features that those um, um, uh, mobile phones have. So which points out, you know, to the issues of training, education, and so on and so forth. So I will stop here for now, just to allow others to also have their five minutes, and then I will come again for the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's wonderful opening remarks there. Um, next, we have Ganella. Hello, and uh, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I uh, just uh, briefly to introduce myself. My name is Gonella Astbrink. I am based in Australia, and uh, it is just after midnight here, and uh, we. Um, um, I am Vice President of the Internet Society uh, Accessibility Special Interest Group and uh, have uh, been involved with disability and accessibility for uh, 25 years plus. Um, and uh, I want to continue on from where Pioche um, uh, talked about the barriers to um, to use of um, technology for persons with disability and as a member of women with disabilities australia um, i can say that there's um, definitely a gender and cultural issues that uh, mean that women with disabilities are often doubly or triply disadvantaged and uh, we need to take into account the, um, the issues about barriers to uptake uh, because of affordability, uh, because of cultural issues, um, training, etc. But I wanted to also mention that when a person is able and, and can afford to use um, uh, some of the technology, there are barriers um, if a person is uh, vision impaired, for example. Um, there's a recent uh, report, as in December, so it's a brand new report, and uh, it uh, has been uh, put together by a company called Diamond, who do uh, web accessibility evaluations, etc. 
uh, they have done a state of accessibility report on an annual basis uh, for the last three years. And this relates to the top 100 websites through Alexa. And, and they also, for the first time, and this is um, pertinent uh, to our discussion in regard to mobile apps. And so they have assessed the top 20 of um, iOS apps on say iPhones and also the top 20 on Android apps. And interestingly, um, Using both automated and manual testing, uh, they have stated that of those top 20 in each of the categories, with the free apps, 65% uh, and 75% of the free Android apps were reasonably accessible, reasonably. Now, that just relates to uh, the use by a screen reader. Um, so that's important to differentiate. There are a lot of other different barriers. Now, what is interesting too is that of the paid apps of, for iOS and Android, 30, only 35% of the paid iOS apps and 29% of the Android apps pass the home screen manual accessibility testing. And that's just looking at the home screen, being able to register, being able to use it from the home screen. Then there could be potentially other barriers. So um, we can see that there is a considerable way to go when it comes to um, reducing those barriers and increasing the accessibility of the apps. And, um, and I think that's something that the App Association might be very interested in. And, uh, and so um, I will continue talking a little bit later during the discussion about a number of other um, drivers uh, to improve accessibility. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, thank you, um, and uh, and and Tim. Yeah, I I'm just trying to calm down a little bit. Sorry, uh, but it was stressful getting here, and I'm I'm so sorry for those who weren't able to. I think some people may be watching on YouTube, so if you're able to, that's great, and uh, maybe somehow you could communicate. But I'm going to be very brief, um, and and really just focus on five points and kind of have them as almost policy dogma uh, from my side. I think the first is we need to think about universality at many, many different levels. I'm mean, both Jorge and, and Gonella have, have, have touched on that, but it, it, it is a sort of universal universality. So um, I'll, I'll try and explain my other points what I mean by that. Secondly, I'm coming to a view that we need to rethink the whole notion of disabilities. Um, and, and, and let me put it this way. We all have abilities, but we all have some disabilities. And what we've tended to do, certainly in, in, in the societies with which I'm familiar, is we, we, we cut out a group and say they are persons with disabilities or they're disabled. And, and, and you have to somehow have a, a certificate to show that you have a particular disability. Whereas actually there are a whole range of other disabilities aren't necessarily certified and you don't necessarily get the benefits from that. And 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 I want to emphasize that you know, if, if, if we try and reconceptualize this, that one of the key points is that somebody who has one disability is perfectly able in lots of other ways and vice versa. Um, and certainly as someone who's, you can tell from the gray hair is aging and needing these much more, you know, as we get older, our disability increases, even if we had r rather less when we were younger. So I actually think that whole notion could usefully be reconsidered, uh, particularly in relationship with technology, because you, know, you can get assistive technology, and I'll come back to that, at a price, you pay for it if you have a particular disability. But there are all those who, who don't have that classified disability who still need to benefit from it. And again, universality is important. Thirdly, 
Um, I, and and I'm not going to say much more about this because Jorge and uh, Gonella have have uh, touched it. But I, I, for me, the key thing is ensuring that everyone who develops new technologies, be they apps or hardware or increasingly converged technologies, has to take fully on board the need for them to be as universally accessible as possible. And, and, and as we've heard already, that just still isn't the case. The developers just don't have that mindset, even though some of them also have lots of disabilities. They may not realise that, going back to my previous point. Um, and, and, and this comes down to capacity development and education. You know, anyone in, in training uh, to, 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 to go into the tech field, be there in computer science or electronic engineering, you know, should have almost a compulsory course in, in understanding uh, the needs of, of people with, with disabilities. <clears throat> That's three. Fourthly, uh, despite being yeah, that, that advocate for the universal, I think there will always be a place for particular assistive technologies to address the needs of particular groups of people. Um, and the key thing there, of course, is that they shouldn't have to pay more for this. All too often, assistive technologies uh, mean that some of the most disadvantaged people in the world actually become more so disadvantaged because they can't afford them. So uh, yeah, I, I, I've been very impressed, for example, with that. I, does anyone here know OptiKey, um, which is a, 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 a development in, uh, by, by a guy in the UK, and which provides a free suite of apps to allow people to use computers using only their eyes. And, and this is being provided for free in, in, in Pakistan. There's a, a little program I know about that. But things like that <clears throat> um, can make a, a, a huge transformative difference, but partly because, you know, a lot of it is open. And then finally, um, and I think it's it's always there and, and uh, being said, but above all, we need to remember, keep remembering and remind people of nothing about us without us. And, and, and I'd just like to touch on the notion of what we may understand by empowerment here, because I think the word empowerment is hugely problematic. It's usually used, um, I'm being a bit deliberately provocative here, so do come back at me, by white middle-aged guys like me empowering poor, underprivileged people in other parts of the world. That to me makes me absolutely, ugh, you know, cringe, um, because empowerment in that sense, is deeply, deeply problematic. And the only true empowerment is when the poor and the marginalized, marginalized take power into their own hands or are able to take power into, over, into their own hands. That's what empowerment means. It's changing the basic power relationships within our societies to enable the poorest and most marginalized, including persons with disabilities, to actually uh, participate <clears throat> and actually take control. So five items, quite provocative, uh, but I look forward to our discussion. And I'd just like to thank uh, the other 11 people who are here who've actually made it um, uh, for a session on, in on accessibility to be made so inaccessible makes me really, really angry. Sorry. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> no, it's, it's true. Some frustrations there. I, I'm with you. Um, Yes, well, thank you all for the opening remarks there. Um, like I mentioned uh, earlier um, to those, uh, this, this is directed to those in the audience, we've certainly got, I, I think there's been, I just, just in listening to the brief opening remarks, some, some interesting threads. I certainly am uh, game to pull on, but uh, we'd really love for your engagement, your intervention. So, so uh, uh, please do, please do jump in here. Um, if, if or, you know, you can, for example, in the chat, I know a couple of people have sort of introduced them themselves. That's that's really great. Uh, I, 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 I just to maybe to start things off a little bit, I, 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 I wondered if uh, uh, I could jump to perhaps a question about how for for you. To, 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 end, to all of the panelists too, I would ask this question. How has the pandemic affected uptake or end or really development of, IC, of, of ICT and, and, and accessibility? And I wondered if there are any lessons we can take or, or any trends we should be aware of, um, uh, you know, um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I wonder if, um, you know, I, I think already in opening remarks, for example, we've talked about uh, infrastructure availability and deployment, you know, enabling 
connectivity, you know, like for that, that will provide for smartphones versus feature phones, provide accessibility that has, how has the pandemic affected these issues for you and your region and globally? I can I can go first, George. George here. So, um, well, I I I think and 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 I'm talking about my experience here uh, in Mozambique, but also I will say it will be the same experience in um, um, other African countries as well, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I will say I mean, um, and I guess this is true. Uh, in many places in the world, I mean, um, because of the, the the measures, you know, to 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 protect against the the COVID, um, you know, there is a boom of services um, online, which, uh, of course, that represents a huge opportunity um, and a potential for persons with disabilities to benefit from that, uh, from those services, but. Um, it's uh, at the same time, it's sad to see uh, how um, those products, services are being developed in completely disregard of accessibility and universal design principles. So you have, um, you know, new services, government and, and, and private services being provided online, which is, again, very useful for the general population, not only for the population of persons with disabilities, but will represent even more uh, um, for persons with disabilities, for instance, those who have difficult mobilities and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a huge potential uh, on that, but um, because of the way those products are being developed, so personal disabilities are being left behind um, on that. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to raise. The second thing is that, um, uh, yes, we have this massive opportunity that is opening up, but uh, it's not only the cost or the, 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 the affordability of the hardware, uh, but it's also um, data, the, the, how expensive is the data um, in most of the countries. Um, so, um, I mean, here in Mozambique, just to give you an example, um, um, for you to be able to have uh, a minimum quality of internet, uh, you will have to pay, I mean, close to uh, five uh, um, uh, euros, you know, to be able to use for, for, for a fair week, right? And this is very expensive. Um, for uh, not only for persons with disabilities, but for the general population uh, uh, here, who I mean, most of them live in below the poverty line. So um, that 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 that's something we have to take into consideration. Um, so again, you have the services that are available, but barely. Uh, you know, a small uh, proportion of the population are able to actually use it, all right? Um, the third thing is uh, related with the fact that, uh, um, you know, persons with disabilities, are especially, I mean, in general, they're, they're not, they, their participation in public life is still very uh, minimum. But especially when it comes to ICT and accessibility things, uh, those things are still regarded as a very technical. So um, uh, inputs from persons with disabilities and so on, they are seen as a marginal, you know? And, 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 and the, the, the results is that we, um, I mean, both the technical uh, experts, uh, they lose a lot of inputs that could make those services very, I mean, uh, uh, more, 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 more responsive to the general population, but also uh, of a high quality, you know? So um, per persons with disabilities, not only here in Mozambique, they are not really engaging, uh, you know, when it comes to ICT accessibility. Um, um, so this is something we really have to pay attention. Uh, there are some um, initiatives that are coming up 
Uh, regionally, um, there's an organization in Uganda called CIPESA, uh, which is a center uh, for on uh, ICT accessibility for East and Southern Africa, which is doing a great work on uh, you know coming up with indicators um, on ICT accessibility, uh, providing grants to uh, organizations of persons with disabilities to be able to um, conduct accessibility audit in government, but not only um, uh, websites and you know service providers, and 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 then use those um, resources and the, the the data that's coming out from that to be able to engage the government, but also service providers. So I guess that's very huge um, uh, thing, especially because they are acting on the demand side, you know, on uh, uh, the, 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 the side of persons with disabilities, um, kind of empowering them to be able to not only, you know, saying, hey, we are being left behind, but actually having evidence, to have evidence to be able to put on the table and say, you know, you guys uh, came up with this solution, but this solution is not responsive to uh, the needs of the majority of the groups of, of persons with disabilities. So uh, that's very huge um, uh, thing. Um, in, in the beginning, I said that uh, awareness on disability is still very, I mean, on the ICT accessibility is still very low, but I was um, very surprised, uh, positive surprise. Uh, last week, as you know, was the, um, um, the week uh, of the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. So I was quite surprised by seeing, uh, you know, um, some governments coming, um, um, you know, with concrete proposals. I'm talking about the government of Uganda, you know, the government of Kenya, um, uh, in Malawi as well, you know, coming up with very concrete um, proposals to be able to advance the agenda of ICT accessibility uh, in their respective countries. So. Uh, I was positively surprised by those commitments coming from high, uh, um, uh, high level officials in Kenya was the president in, New in Malawi as well, also in, in Uganda as well. So that uh, meant a lot uh, um, specifically because they did raise concrete issues that relates to disability uh, and ICT accessibility. So yes, thank you so much, I'll stop here. For now. Thanks. Does anyone else want to add on yes. to that? Great. Can I add some um, comments to that? Uh, following on from uh, what Tim and Georgia has um, has talked about, uh, certainly when it um, when it comes to this year's theme of the International um, Day of Persons with Disability. The, it's entitled Leadership and Participation of Persons with Disability towards an inclusive, accessible, and sustainable post-COVID-19 world. And, and so it's, it's very, very encouraging that we, we need to work towards uh, more persons with disability being involved in organizations. And, and so to be able to um, have people on boards, uh, for example, with the Internet Society, Mohammed Shabir Awan from Pakistan, uh, who has a vision impairment, is probably the first person with a disability on that board of trustees, which means uh, being able to contribute to policy and strategy on the highest level of, of, um, of um, Internet uh, policy. So, um, we need those voices. We need those voices within organizations. And it, it might be that um, if, if there were more opportunities for persons with disability to be employed in government, in nonprofits, in industry, then uh, people will see that there are persons with disability around in the community. Often it's this thing about, oh, as, as Tim was talking about, they are other, they are different. 
whereas we are all one, but we have different types of disabilities. And that's what needs to be conveyed. And in the workplace, that's a very important place to be able to do that and to, to make cultural change and to, to influence those, those policies and programs and communications. And, and the key phrase is nothing about us without us. So it's, it's taking that control, which is so important. Uh, so um, they are probably um, the things I could respond to, but I have a few other comments. Can I follow on, Brian, with that? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just going back to um, those statistics I mentioned earlier, uh, about accessible and non-accessible apps. Um, wouldn't it be good if uh, an organization or a developer, every time they develop something, have a sort of accessibility filter, just to be aware that, okay, we have, we have international guidelines, let's have a look at them. How do, we, how would, do we do this in the best possible way? And if the team of developers uh, haven't got the experience of accessibility, then there are a large number of companies and organizations who can provide that support. And obviously, W3C, um, the World Wide Web Foundation, is um, the foundation of those web accessibility content guidelines, which uh, are used by governments and many uh, private industry organizations to ensure there's uni uniformity in the way um, tools are made accessible. So I think that's really important. And uh, I just also wanted to um, look at another point uh, and, and we're coming back to universal design. And really, um, if you look at the, the traditional um, uh, curb cut, say, uh, or from a footpath, then uh, if, if that is done with accessibility, so a, a wheelchair user can use it, then a delivery cart can use it, then, then a, um, a, a person with a pram can use it, it's good for a wider range of persons in the community. And if you're talking about that in the online world, it's not only designing for accessibility for what actually is a large group of people globally. We're talking about 15% of the world's population, which is say 1.5 billion people internationally. We're talking about a huge number of people. And, and just also looking at it from a point of market forces, we're missing out on a market here to provide services that people can buy if they can afford them. And, and, and also to make sure that they are um, accessible and that means that has flow on effects to everyone because often if something is accessible, it's really quite usable by most people in the community. I'll stop there for now. I've got some other points to make if I have time. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, T Tim, I, I, I think um, I was actually gonna, gonna point to you anyway because I, I thought that one of the resources that you shared at an earlier phase here, the... Um, the report on technology and education for the most marginalized in a post COVID-19 environment. I thought that might, I, I would ask you to maybe summarize that because it seems spot on, but also I think some of, you know, any other comments? Uh, I, I was going to be um, and say, let's move on to a different question because we haven't much time. But in essence, this was a uh, global report we put together, a group of us uh, funded by the World Bank Dif and DFID and um, it, it's ideal to provide guidance notes for governments on how to uh, ensure that they use digital tech to support the education of the poorest and most marginalised, <clears throat> not just the rich and powerful. And it had a series of guidance notes at the end, as well as being an overall volume. One of those was specifically on um, how to support persons with disabilities. But the whole theme going through it includes that. So uh, that would be my answer for 
uh, in the field of education. But um, I, as you can imagine, I could talk for hours on that. It's in three acts. There's an executive summary, Act 1. Act 2 is the bulk of the re full report. Act 3 is the guidance notes. And they're called acts. Have you ever seen an official report like it's called acts? But they're acts just because they have to be performed on the world stage. Um, in the theater and also act because those are the first three letters of the word action which is so important excellent i might take that if, if it's okay I, I might commandeer that that approach to uh to deliverables we put out um as long as you show where credit's due well <laughs> um Excellent. All right. Well, you're probably right, Tim. I, I know that that we don't have um, a human, uh, you know, a, a, and you, I, uh, folks. I hope you can you can tell that um, uh, the expertise here is deep, and and everybody here is quite passionate. So you're right. We could go on on any one of these questions for quite a long time, but um, uh, you know, d definitely a probably a fair suggestion there. We should maybe look to another question. I I, I was thinking about some emerging. Tech, if you want to call them that, emerging technologies or ones that have just emerged. Um, artificial intelligence tools, predictive analytics, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, vir you know, even virtual reality technologies and things like that. Um, how, how do you all see these technologies playing in? And, and is, is accessibility being infused by design? in some of these newer technologies that are, that are coming out? Do you see any other? I mean, there's lots of discussion, no matter where you look, when, for example, just looking at predictive algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other terminologies like that, ethics, bias, maintenance, um, uh, preservation of privacy and other data stewardship practices and things like that. Everywhere you look, people are discussing them appropriately. So uh is there how do, how do you all see accessibility developing with some of these uh newer technologies um that are that are starting to mature facial recognition for example uh, and uh you know and and what 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 is there anything that that you would change from a governance perspective and, and when i i'm sorry this is about three questions rather than one but and when i say governance i mean i that could mean a, a government making some kind of policy change it could mean an organization's governance it could mean uh you know um something that might just be generated across different communities in a in a forum like like the igf uh so i guess I, i'm just saying i mean governance in the broadest sense but internet governance uh, <laughs> anyone want to tackle that uh long-winded question quite the wind up there i know but uh, I have my hand up. So I was last first time. So I'll be very quick this time. Um, just just to say, I, I, I've always been passionate about the potential of smart cars for smart humans. So so and, and I know there are people who, who are actually out there um, beginning to work on this. But imagine if um, people with visual impairments uh, you were able to act like a smart car. And so they would know when something was about to bump into them or they were so, so the sensors around it. I, that, 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 that I think is one, you know, exciting way um, for the future. I mean, it, 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 yeah, that's just a tiny part of it. But, but one thing's that, and, and the other, I would, I've already mentioned OptiKey, which I'm a great fan of as an example of something really being done uh, very high tech but um, made uh, reasonably cheaply available, well, freely available um, to people as well. So those would be my two penny worth on you know, the, the future. George or uh, Ganella, do you get, it's, a, it's okay if you, uh, <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, look, I, I, I think this, uh, so much potential and uh, sometimes innovation in the disability field uh, can lead to actually very uh, mainstream products and and I'll go I'll go right back to uh, something like um, persons with physical disability who couldn't use a keyboard and and so there was a, um, a drag and dictate for example uh, where people could speak to the computer 
and and so forth. And and this was back 30 years ago, revolutionary and 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 uh, very expensive. But it this this technology was designed for for persons with disability, and now we have speech recognition everywhere. So some some of those um, innovations uh, can really make a difference. And I think when it comes to virtual reality, um, they they are in the A one one Y community, which are um, accessibility geeks and enthusiasts um, who are working on some very exciting virtual reality applications, uh, uh, especially for pe persons who have uh, limited physical mobility. So there's a lot that will be happening, I'd say, in the future and, and can have mainstream um, applications. Well, I've I've been uh, I've been notified uh, that we are we are we are approaching the end, but uh, but I I think that there was there there's a, a number of good questions coming in from the audience in the chat, which is great. Thank you all for the participation and the interventions. Um, one question: th This might trying to trying to take a few different themes at least or parts of questions that I've seen so far. Um, one question I see here is, um, is how can we make access, accessible technologies more affordable? And I think that, that, that at a high level, that's obviously a very important question. I think we've, we've touched on s s different maybe layers. Uh, curious what you all think about this, but different layers from infrastructure to the device at the end of that value chain that's in the hand of of a consumer, uh, and um, and then uh, and then we were just talking about emerging technologies, um, which, um, depending on the community and and the the location, may be completely um, unavailable, right, uh, for for a number of reasons, um, or or widely available, <laughs> um, so. Uh, you know, from a, maybe, maybe, uh, and, and it, it could be a, an interesting question about, uh, 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 you know, that for, for us to kind of, uh, to, to bring us sort of to the end is if, if you were to say, say to each, to each panelist, if you were to pick one or two, you know, top, top thing, top things that could be done from a, you know, governance perspective. And again, I mean, that broadly is how, how would you make accessible technologies more affordable? Okay, um, <laughs> I, I'll just <laughs> yeah. put myself in there. Well, I guess um, one of the things is to um, popularize, you know, the, the 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 those technologies, right? So, um, so I, I like to, and I guess that's the approach from at least from the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, you know, to so think disability as part of the human diversity. You know, so meaning that uh, when we do things, we have to do things thinking about every potential user of that product, of that uh, device, or whatever it is. So um, I think part of the 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 the, the way we can uh, bring the costs down is to uh, mainstream accessibility in everything that. I mean, all the technologies. So we don't see as a something special, something extra, which therefore costs uh, should cost more, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is to um, um, you know issues of standards. I think it's very important. I think Gunella raised that. Um, I, th I think that's important. And um, uh, I mean. Uh, and that also we have to deal, I mean, uh, consider what happens in the north, in the global north, in the global south. Unfortunately, uh, governments and the global south 
will have little power to influence you know global standards and so on and so forth but uh, that's why i think international cooperation on these issues are very important you know to make sure that whatever is designed uh, i know that's very difficult to do it you know to design inclusive for the whole world but at least that agree on minimum standards and then um, i mean fed adjustments and so on can be done in a context specific base so um, I think, but international cooperation, this issue is very important and can help as well bring the, the, the cost down. So I'll just put those two ideas forward on that. Thank you. Anyone else? I see uh, Tim has a, a very, um, uh, uh, I, I personally, I think is a great suggestion, having more, more people in government who are recognized as persons with disabilities. That's, that's also a great suggestion. Well, uh, uh, I just want to make sure. I see you're unmuted, you know. <laughs> Don't want to jump the gun there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, just, just very quickly, I, I mentioned in the chat about um, um, ICT uh, uh, accessibility criteria in public procurement, as in government purchasing. And, uh, and that, that makes a huge difference because it means major corporations, uh, uh, if they if are going to be successful uh, in tenders to the government, uh, then uh, uh, they need to uh, ensure their products are accessible. And, and that has a flow on effect. And it might take quite a while for that flow on effect to occur, but over time, one would hope that it does make a difference. And I just also want to touch on a couple of um, uh, European-based directives and uh, legislation. Um, one is the um, uh, Web Accessibility Directive and the other is the European Accessibility Act. And, and they are required um, through the Accessibility Act for uh, governments uh, to show how they um, provide accessible uh, services. And, and if any um, a company wants to develop something and, and provide it to any European country, uh, then it needs to be accessible in future. It's still in progress. But um, there's not enough time to talk about it in, a, in more detail, but uh, um, it's, it's worthwhile uh, having a look at the European Accessibility Act and the Web Accessibility Directive and seeing what influence that can have in future. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And, you know, I, I think uh, we, we can, we can um, in, our, in our post session recap report, I think we can, we can ensure that we uh, point people to to that th those very important resources. I agree, and uh, I think it's great you raised them. So uh, I I do apologize uh, because we are though though we we started a, a tad late uh, and when there had some technical difficulties. We uh, we are we are at time for this for this session. I greatly appreciate the participation here by 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 George Ganella Tim thank you so much uh, for for joining sharing uh, uh, your perspectives and and to all who joined uh, 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 we you know I, I think uh, uh, this I, I hope is is just yet another step in 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 a, in a you know a global a global discussion that that reflects uh, I think uh, a the broadest commitment to advancing accessibility through through ICT, uh, uh, no matter where where somebody is or or what disability that that they have. So uh, I know that my, from my own organization, we we absolutely share that that priority. I, I personally, even at pr previous organizations I had, I've long personally uh, had a commitment for that, and I'm very passionate about that myself. So um, uh, uh, thank you again, uh, and and thank you to to IGF. I, I think that concludes our panel.